ChatGPT surpassed a million users in less than a week. And to compare, it took Twitter two years to reach a million users, Facebook 10 months, and Instagram two and a half months. At multiple points last week, the service was so popular that they had to stop users from using the chat. And for those that are not aware, ChatGPT is a language model that generates human-like responses to text input. But unlike similar AI text assistants, it does a phenomenal job at it. It's really hard to overstate the importance of these language models and how they'll disrupt a lot of industries, but that's a topic for another video. In this video though, I'm going to show you the main ways I'm using ChatGPT as well as some important caveats about it. If you've never used it before, you can just head over to OpenAI's website and you'll find ChatGPT on top. And if you're a Mac user, there's an app that you can install to have ChatGPT inside your menu bar. And the app is just called ChatGPT and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. All right, so the first major way I'm using this tool is as a Google alternative for certain types of queries. For instance, I'm heading to London in January and normally I just Google things to do and cool itineraries. But this time I thought, why don't I ask this to ChatGPT? And as you can see, the results are pretty good. And in fact, I already added some of this to my itinerary. Another way I've been using it has been gift ideas, which is something I'm frankly not too good at. And since Christmas is approaching, I use ChatGPT and the results are pretty good, especially once you describe the person you're buying a gift for. And the best part is if you don't like the recommendations, simply try again or add more inputs. I have a lot more thoughts on how a language model like ChatGPT could change the search engine space and potentially force Google to innovate, but that's a topic for another video. The other type of query where ChatGPT really shines is programming related. It can basically write anything you tell it to write. If you have an idea for a script, you can simply tell it and it will do a really good, if not perfect job at it, all while providing loads of information along the way. And after explaining every step of the way, you'll even end up with a full script where you just have to adjust some inputs before seeing it in action. Some people have created entire games and applications with it without even knowing how to code. If you have no idea how to code, ChatGPT can also be a really good source of education for it. You can tell it to give you a project to learn Python as well as a solution, and you can ask for more advanced projects as you start to learn more. Another personal use case that I've noticed it excels at is at answering technical questions. For instance, I do a lot of playing around in my home lab with VLANs, automations, containers, etc. And I find myself Googling all the time about how to do this and that. And I've started to ask those same questions to ChatGPT and the result has been super positive. I just wish this had been around ages ago. The next way I use ChatGPT is actually to consume content. I subscribe to some article aggregators such as Refined and Hacker News, and the content there is usually pretty good, and I'm happy to read through it, but sometimes it's a very long piece with several pages, and ChatGPT can actually summarize all of it for you. You could just type TLDR, which if you didn't know stands for too long, then read, and then simply copy and paste the entire article into the chat box, and it's going to give you all of the main points and the key insights from it. These are articles that I wouldn't be reading at all if it weren't for this tool, simply because I don't have the time for it. So instead, I get all of it summarized by ChatGPT. And in some cases, if the summary is really appealing, I'll go and make time to read the whole thing. But I never would have known that without ChatGPT. The next way is content creating, which is probably the most controversial one of all, simply because it does such a good job at it. Let's look at an example here and let's say that I'm doing an article or video on stoicism. I can just open up ChatGPT and say outline a video about the benefits of stoicism and it does such a good job at it that you could just take that as your baseline and go from there. And you can be very specific about it. Let's say you're starting to script your video or article and you want a quirky introduction into the topic. Well, then simply tell ChatGPT to write a quirky introduction to a video titled The Benefits of Stoicism. And once again, as you can see, it does a really good job. So now let's say that you're done and you want a quirky conclusion to go with your quirky introduction. Simply say, write a quirky conclusion to a video titled The Benefits of Stoicism. And as you can see, by just using these three prompts, you're basically halfway through scripting your video. I think this is way more dystopian for written text as it does such a good job at it, it's hard to believe it wasn't written by a person. And the unfortunate truth is that articles are going to be more and more AI written as this develops. But this only applies to written text because no matter how good of an outline the AI makes a YouTube video script, most creators would never simply take that at face value. And even if they did, they still have to add their own personality and charisma to it, which is something the AI is light years away from doing effectively. The next use case is communication. You can use ChatGPT to compose emails for you based on what tone you want it to use. So for instance, I can say, write an email to my manager John, politely asking if we could push today's meeting for tomorrow. You can also be very specific with it. You can say something like, write an extremely formal email to my manager John, politely asking if we could push today's meeting for tomorrow. Or let's say you already have an email and you just want to switch up the tone. Then you can just say, turn this email into a more formal one. Now obviously, simply taking the response at face value and pasting it into an email wouldn't be the best of ideas but you can use it to get some inspiration and to better construct your emails. We still have to go through some important caveats as well as differentiating ChatGPT from GPT-3. But before that, I want to talk about today's sponsor, which is Walling. Walling is a visual workspace that offers a fast and dynamic experience to quickly collect ideas, notes, and files. It lets you rearrange them and most importantly, visually organize them in different sections on the same visual wall. That's what makes it unique. Visual communication is a more effective way to communicate ideas than writing them out in a linear format. But the interface of Walling is not just visual, it's also clean and intuitive to improve your focus and increase your productivity. 
Walling's interface also makes it easy for new users to get up and running quickly. There's no jumping between pages or overcomplicated workflows, and the lack of complex menus or hidden features ensures that you can find what you need quickly and easily, so you can start using Walling to its full potential from the very beginning. You can invite someone to your wall to collaborate with you, or you can share a link to your wall via email or Slack, making it also a great solution for teams. Visually organize all your ideas and projects with Walling by checking them out using my link below. Thanks Walling for sponsoring this video. All right, so let's now go over some caveats to using ChatGPT, and especially with relying on it too much. The first is that you can't take every single outcome of the chat as being true. It makes mistakes, and sometimes they're not that obvious to spot. On a similar note, you should be extra careful if you're a student or an academics, and you want to use this for work like essays or research papers because you might be plagiarizing. Another caveat is that although ChatGPT is free for now, that's mostly to beta test its capabilities and exponentially develop the model through us, the beta testers. Given the eye-watering cost of running ChatGPT at scale as OpenAI is doing, I find it hard to believe this will remain 100% free for long. Not to mention that other models like DaVinci 3 are paid. There are many ways OpenAI can monetize a service, whether it is by having a cost per thousand tokens like DaVinci or via ads. I don't know which way it'll go, but keep that in mind if you're making extended use of it. Lastly, and this is an ongoing discussion that I'm frankly not qualified to talk too much about, is the ethics and copyright issues surrounding not just ChatGPT, but AI in general, particularly models more focused toward digital art such as DALI, as with those you can even generate a painting in the style of a famous painter. Not only that, but the inevitable growth of these systems is allowing many people to create entire blogs written by AI in a couple of minutes. And therefore, they're able to put out an insane amount of content and rank for many keywords in Google, and chances are, you've probably read some of these AI generated posts without even realizing. I want to also make an important distinction between GPT-3 and ChatGPT, because these terms are used interchangeably, but they're quite different. ChatGPT is a smaller, more specialized language model that is designed to generate natural sounding responses in conversation. As the name implies, it's meant to be used in a chat. GPT-3, on the other hand, is more of a general purpose model. It's way more customizable and you can use it in apps like Obsidian or Logsig. It's also worth noting that while cheap, GPT-3 is not free, whereas for now, ChatGPT is. In this video, we only focused on ChatGPT, and in one of my next videos, which might already be out by the time you're watching this, we're going to explore GPT-3. Thanks guys for watching this video. Have a great one. Bye.